Peter Navarro, one of the key authors of the plan to overturn the legitimate results of the 2020 election, was arrested today and charged by the Department of Justice with two counts of contempt of Congress for his refusal to comply with the January 6th committee. The first count was for failing to appear for a deposition. The second was for failing to produce documents that the committee requested. Navarro, who was represented by a public defender, did not enter a plea during a court appearance today. Outside the courthouse, the man who seems to love the camera launched into a litany of unhinged claims against the DOJ and the January 6th committee. That's sort of a thing with Navarro. He loves to talk. He isn't shy about the plan that he and fellow indictee Steve Bannon cooked up, which they dubbed the Green Bay Sweep. My colleague Ari Melber asked him about that last night. So you're risking going potentially to jail, not to talk to them, but you're out here talking in public. You do realize these investigators can hear you when you talk on TV. What we're talking about now, Ari, is the case law itself and the constitutionality of executive privilege, testimony immunity. A second key issue in the case is the separation of powers. The plan was to keep Trump in office by pressuring Vice President Mike Pence to block the certification of the electoral votes from key swing states. Again, Navarro and Bannon wanted to force the Vice President of the United States to ignore the results of a free and fair election, and by default, they wanted Congress to ignore the will of the people as well because their guy lost by 7 million votes. In refusing to appear before the January 6th committee, Navarro claimed over and over again that he is exempt because of executive privilege. But here's the thing, he ain't got it. Navarro then appears to fall back on the vague assertion that the executive privilege here belongs to former President Trump, which is not only dubious, but entirely irrelevant because our committee has not been given any attempted invocation of executive privilege by Donald Trump. Navarro and Bannon are just two of the four individuals that the House committee referred to the Department of Justice, which leaves us with this question. What about former Trump chief of staff Mark Meadows and former Trump aide Dan Scavino? With me now, Glenn Kirshner, former federal prosecutor and an MSNBC legal analyst. So, Glenn, before I get to Peter Navarro, can you ask that question for me? Because it does seem like Mark Meadows and Scavino, who was Trump's social media guy, they were actually closer to Trump in their jobs. They were White House aides and closer to Trump on the day of the insurrection. Do, do you, can you explain to us why Navarro, who was trade secretary, and, and others, that, that, that Meadows and Cavino are not being arrested and indicted? It's, you know, I can't explain it, Joy, because, you know, we don't know what we don't know about the way the Department of Justice is going about investigating these men or pursuing these contempt of Congress referrals. It seems like Navarro is more in the Scavino sort of mold, right? They, they kind of held comparable positions. But Mark Meadows, of course, as chief of staff to then President Donald Trump, I can see how that would be a little bit more of a challenge for the Department of Justice to make sure if they're going to do it, they get it right. But it could be also a product of the fact that they're talking with and negotiating with a Mark mm -hmm. Meadows because he's a big criminal fish. He is well up there yeah. on one of the higher rungs of the criminal ladder. So it could be that they're working out cooperation with Meadows. We, we won't know until we know. Uh, and so there's all this stuff with Navarro. Let's go back to him for a second. So he came out of the courtroom today, gave a, you know, sort of grandiose uh, sort of presentation to reporters, claimed that the January 6th committee is acting as judge, jury and executioner and saying the Constitution was violated and it's coercion and it's terrorism and all this stuff. I mean, this guy actually filed a civil case. He actually sued. He sued. He filed an 88 page complaint listing the U.S. attorney that's involved um, for D.C., the select committee, Nancy Pelosi and others. And, and, and again, trying to claim that he can act under executive privilege that Trump hasn't claimed just because Trump was president at one time. Please unpack this argument for us. You know, it's a bunch of nonsensical word salad that um, Peter Navarro offers every time he's on TV running his mouth. And he also offered it to the judge in that suit that he filed. Judge Randy Moss basically said, you don't know what you're talking about. Go away and try again, and gave him until June 17th to try again. He doesn't have an executive privilege claim for multiple reasons, Joy. One, Joe Biden is the holder of the privilege at this moment, and he's waived it. He has chosen not to invoke it. 
Um, two, you know, he, he was not really a, a member of the executive branch at the time. Um, it, there, there are a number of ways you can defeat Peter Navarro's claim of executive privilege. Um, and at the end of the day, Donald Trump has never asserted it, as members of the J6 committee have, uh, have explained. So, you know, Peter Navarro has got nothing but word salad. But, you know, yeah. I'm just very pleased that he's finally going to be standing in court and 12 jurors are going to make this decision, as opposed to us all speculating about what right. should we do with Peter Navarro. The fact that he sued means he does have a lawyer working for him in some capacity. Does it surprise you that he had a public defender for this case? You know, it doesn't surprise me that the court insisted on a public defender standing in, at least for his arraignment on the indictment. He may continue mm -hmm. to insist to represent himself. And he has a constitutional right, an absolute constitutional right under the Sixth Amendment, both to have counsel represent him and to waive yeah. that right to counsel and represent himself. He will have a fool for a client, but the good news is he cannot make an ineffective assistance of counsel claim in the event of yeah. a conviction if he chooses to represent himself. Uh, let, let's go to th this, this other stuff, because you do have a proud boy that pleaded Keith Gill today, uh, admitting that he nearly reached Senator Schumer during the Capitol siege. There was considerable violence at play that we all saw live on television on January 6th. But there's also this new reporting from Maggie Haberman at The New York Times that before January 6th, an aide to Vice President Pence was warned um, and warned uh, by the Secret Service of a security risk to Pence. Here's what the reporting says. The day before a mob of President Donald J. Trump supporters stormed the Capitol on January 6th, Vice President Mike Pence's chief of staff called Mr. Pence's lead Secret Service agent to his West Wing office. The president was going to turn publicly against the vice president, and there could be a security risk to Mr. Pence because of it. We know that hang Mike Pence was chanted. People brought a news. People were hunting Mike Pence. What does it do for all to all of these defendants? And does it creep closer to the White House to know that people knew that Mike Pence's life was likely in danger? Yeah, it absolutely does creep closer to the White House and makes its way directly into the Oval Office. All of these insurrectionists who are being tried and convicted, they can claim I was only following my president's orders but that's not a legal defense. It may be relevant to their sentence in the event of conviction, but it is not a defense.